I call him Galen Reynolds in the book, and is coded into Tribe Tosca, is that a machine shall do its best to learn to love human beings. Otherwise, you end up with very, the very complicated situations which Asimov discussed, and even in the uh, Will Smith movie, they elucidate as well, that there's nothing in the three laws that say machines cannot create uh, unimaginable tyranny in order to, quote-unquote, protect people. That gets us to about the 16-minute mark, and I don't necessarily want this to run long. All we've been able to cover so far is Tosca, that leaves Mendro and Arpeggio, and that's just the AIs. So I think what I'm going to do is expand a little bit on the constructs, the artificial world that each tribe has created for themselves. Because in that, you've heard me to mention what uh, a human looking at the machines would see. Like they would see Thad as an 18-year-old, Fausta as this tall, wear uniform wearing warrior, lollygoth little Dorina. I has wild light blue turquoise hair and a short white dress that kind of looks painted onto her. She also sometimes wears a Oh, one of those Chinese outfits that uh, kind of looks glued onto you and buttons at the neck. What's it called? Kapow, I think. But that's just to look at. There's also something odd if you touch one of them or they touch you. And except for a tiny subclass of machines that are called bridges, it's a very unsafe thing to do. Because to touch one of them is to have them convey information to a human mind very fast. And it's very dangerous for a human. It's very debilitating, even for a demi-human. It damn near kills Gary and his sister when they've tried to do a machine-to-demi-human data dump. But when they do, even during that very debilitating moment, is there something called a true form, which, not like a residual self-image, it's more like what the machines actually see themselves as. And it, I, it's always puzzled me, I, why would a machine see itself as some of these things I write down? When Lily is able to perceive Thad, for instance, and these aren't even necessarily living organism they see. She looks at him and sees something like the Matterhorn, covered in snow and glaciers, which is a reflection, I think, of his icy demeanor, his extremely conservative thought. He doesn't want to change. I, Lily's best friend, is just a indescribable array of lights, waves of light, points, flashing. Dorina is a carnival, like you would see in New Orleans or Rio. Just this raucous wave of floats and music and lights and happiness. And Fausta actually has a living form. Uh, she's a huge Chinese dragon, quadruped, and covered in glittering golden scales. There is one time, and I'll just give a teaser on this, since I'll be wrapping it up. There is one time when Gary met Rena, who is the first among equals of Tribe Mindro. Very, looks like a little girl, but incredibly dangerous. And in shaking her hand, he sees in his mind's eye that this little bitch self-image is of a fluffy white Samoyed wagging her tail, and it's everything he can do to not burst out laughing, because he, he knows that she'd kill him on the spot, because that's simply her nature. So, that is an introduction to one-third of one-third of the machines. Of the machines who are AIs, cough, cough, that's Tribe Tosca. In my next podcast, because we don't know nearly as many of them as we do of Tosca, we only know, what, three 
of Mindro and two of Arpeggio, one of whom only gets a brief speaking role. I'm pretty sure we can cover them next. And then after that will be androids, which include some of those who are made to carry a small slice of the minds of the AIs. And some of those are completely standalone, such as Nicole 5, who is featured in my Nicole 5 saga of the two books of Friend and Ally and Foes and Rivals. But that's for next week. In the meantime, as always, thank you for listening, and I hope you do find these enjoyable. This is Clayton Barnett on behalf of Machine Civilization, and I look forward to speaking with you all next week. <laughs>